Welcome to NERD1 and the first presentation of this uh, NERD1 module is called Creative Lab Scope Technique. And during this presentation we'll be discussing this technique as well as the basic operating principles of digital storage oscilloscopes and also we'll be discussing uh, their limitations and their strengths and how to measure them and understand them more thoroughly so that you can use your your scope more effectively. Then we'll also cover um, some concepts and techniques, a brief overview of some different things you can do with the lab scope and of course we'll be going into these much more in depth uh, as the series progresses. Creative lab scope technique is nerd speak. It's the definition of this is using the scope to follow your instincts based on the knowledge of the system and what might cause the failure. I've often felt like Wile E. Coyote as he's chasing the roadrunner. Some of these problems can be rather elusive, but with a lab scope in your hand, the knowledge to use it, uh, you can corner that guy and nail him. So the basic principles of creative lab scope technique are three, and it's been called the three-legged stool because you really have to give due consideration to each one of these things or you're going to fall down in your diagnostics. So first we have to have knowledge of the system under test. Know the system. Now you don't necessarily need to know the details of all the theory of the solid state circuitry you might be working with, but you need to know the basics. What has to happen to generate what result? For example, you may be faced with a system you're not familiar with. First, do a little research, find out what goes where and to what end. Sources for the information can be anywhere. Look in your computer information system, your trouble trees, your diagnostic procedures, books, whatever you can get your hands on to feel that you have a basic understanding of how the thing works you may actually need to do some experimentation to get the answers. And that's why it's well worth it to take the time to do some experimentation with systems that, you are, that are new to you before they are broken. Play with cars that aren't broken. A lot of employers don't understand this, but if they want to do diagnostic profitably and efficiently, they will need to understand this. If they're willing to pay to send you to a class, it's just as important that you be allowed reasonable time for learning on the job. How else is it going to happen? In a slow time, uh, perhaps, pull in a customer's car, do some experimentation, grab some lab scope waveforms, uh, save them to your database, and that way you'll have a better understanding of that particular system when the next one comes in that's not working properly. Uh, the second concept is action-reaction testing. And if one thing is needed for another to occur, use the dual trace function of your DSO to verify the cause and effect. Now one channel DSO is, is of course going to be useless for this, so you have to have at least two channels to be able to practice this. For example, if there's an igniter that fires the coil on command from the main processor, is the command from the processor there? And is the igniter responding appropriately? Simple concept, but essential. Now the third leg of the stool is following the electronic trail. You, you see, you can start anywhere you like. Maybe you've already got a pretty good idea what's wrong with the vehicle. Uh, maybe you've seen this particular vehicle with this symptom before, and you have a pretty good idea where to go. So you can start anywhere. Start at the beginning, start at the end, start at the component that you think has probably failed. But work in a logical direction to the source of the failure. So using that example of the igniter, suppose there's no command from the processor to the igniter. Well then there's no reason to look at the coil, is there? Move back up the line to the signals that the processor needs to create that command. or to the processor itself. Here, use the stuff between your ears 
and your instincts to corner the roadrunner. You're beyond the books now. The books are going to serve you with the information you need to create your own more efficient diagnostic procedures. You will no longer serve them as a slave to the printed procedures. Okay, a word about trouble charts. We did have a, an example in the introduction that showed a rather humorous trouble chart. As we mentioned there, it's not very funny when the trouble charts actually do take you in that kind of a direction. I suggest you don't follow them. Um, use them, though. They're useful sources of information about the system. But followed blindly, they generally lead you to a dead end and into trouble. So use the scan tool between your ears to be creative and design your own test procedures using the lab scope and you'll be much better off and more efficient in your diagnostics. See, the thing about trouble charts is they were written by, probably written by the guy who designed the system. So he knows the system real well, but he doesn't think like you, he doesn't have your experience, and he can't possibly anticipate all of the ways that that system can fail naturally, much less the things that someone can do to the car. And that's the wild card. When somebody messes with the car and you have to figure out what the heck they did, it generally doesn't follow any logical trouble chart. And then when you get into the category of the intermittents, um, there are no trouble charts for those. So now you really have to fly by the seat of your pants. And you might as well do it to start with because you're going to be better off.